ako kanina. Hello everyone, welcome back to Law and Obligations and Contracts. For this video, we will discuss about extinguishment of obligations. Under the law, there are different modes of extinguishing an obligations. Under Article 1231, obligations are extinguished, number one, by payment or performance, number two, by the loss of the thing due, number three, by the condemnation or remission of the debt, number four, by the confusion or merger of the rights of creditor and debtor, number five, by compensation, number six, by innovation. Other causes of extinguishment of obligations such as annulment, rescission, fulfillment of a resolutory condition and prescription are governed elsewhere in this code. So the first six that uh, we have enumerated is called as the primary modes of extinguishing obligations. And the second paragraph refers to the secondary mode of extinguishing an obligations. So there are other causes pa of extinguishing obligations. And what are those? Number one, death of a party in case of an obligation requiring personal service. Number two, mutual desistance or withdrawal. Number three, arrival of the resolutory period. Number four, compromise. Number five, impossibility of fulfillment. And lastly, the happening of a fortuitous event. So we will start first with payment or performance. So what is payment? Under Article 1232, payment means not only the delivery of money, but also the performance in any other manner of an obligation. What is the meaning of payment? In ordinary parlance, payment refers only to the delivery of money. However, as a legal mode of extinguishing an obligation, payment has a much wider meaning. So under the law, payment may consist of not only the delivery of money, but also the performance of any other obligation, such as the giving of a thing other than money, doing of an act, or not doing of an act. For example, if A obliges himself to deliver a car to B, then the delivery of a car to B is the performance of an obligation. Therefore, there is payment under the law so as to extinguish the obligation. So we can say that in law, payment or performance are synonymous. So requisites for a valid payment. Number one, Article 1233, a debt shall not be understood to have been paid unless the thing or service in which the obligation consists has been completely delivered or rendered as the case may be. So this particular article refers to the principle of integrity. The second requisite is under Article 1244. The debtor of a thing cannot compel the creditor to receive a different one, although the latter may be of the same value as or more valuable than that which is due. In obligations to do or not to do, an act or forbearance cannot be substituted by another act or forbearance against the obligee's will. So this particular article is the principle of identity. So what is this principle of integrity? In order to understand this better, let us have an illustration. Sandra obliged herself to deliver 100 sacks of rice to Brenda. If Sandra will deliver only 90 sacks of rice to Brenda, there is no valid payment. Why? Because the principle of integrity provides that a debt to deliver a thing, including money, or to render service is, uh, is not understood to have been paid unless the thing or service has been completely delivered or rendered, as the case may be. Since there is only partial or irregular performance made by Sandra, then it will not produce the extinguishment of an obligation as a general rule. So, even if Sandra ha had already delivered 90 sacks of rice to Brenda, the such delivery will not constitute a valid payment since it is not completely or it is not completely delivered or rendered 
So let's go to the second requisite. Under the law, the second requisite means that the very prestation due must be delivered or performed. So in the same example given, let us um, add some information in the given example. Let us say Sandra obliged herself to deliver 100 sacks of 160 variety rice to Brenda. Under the principle of identity, the very prestation due must be delivered or performed. In the given example, the very prestation due is the 160 variety of rice with 100 sacks quantity. So therefore, uh, in order to comply with the principle of identity, Sandra should deliver the entire 100 sacks of 160 variety of rice. Otherwise, if Sandra will deliver a different kind or a different variety of rice than that agreed upon by the parties, then the principle of identity is not complied with. Therefore, the obligation is not extinguished. So, you already know the requisites for a valid payment so as to extinguish the obligation. Again, the first one is the principle of integrity which requires that the performance of the obligation is complete. And the second one is the principle of identity which requires that the very prestation due must be delivered or performed. So, let's go to the exceptions to the rule. Under the law, the general rule is that a debt shall not be understood to have been paid unless the thing or service in which the obligation consists has been completely delivered or rendered as the case may be. So meaning to say, uh, there should be complete delivery of the thing that is subject of the obligation. But that is only a general rule. There are exceptions to the rule. And those exceptions can be found under Article 1234 and Article 1235. And what are those? Under Article 1234, it refers to substantial performance in good faith. If the obligation has been substantially performed in good faith, the obligor may recover as though there had been a strict and complete fulfillment, less damages suffered by the obligee. Under Article 1235, incomplete or, reg or irregular performance is waived. When the obligee accepts the performance, knowing its incompleteness or irregularity, and without expressing any protest or objection, the obligation is deemed fully complied with. So let us have an illustration. For substantial performance in good faith under Article 1234, the requisites are there must be substantial performance and the obligor must be in good faith. For example, Sandra obliges herself to deliver 500 bags of cement to Brenda. However, despite diligent efforts to, on the part of Sandra, she was able to deliver only 400 bags because of cement shortage. Take note that Sandra wants to comply with her obligation to deliver the entire 500 bags, but she could not do so for reasons beyond her control. So under Article 1234, Sandra can recover as though there had been complete delivery less the price of the 100 bags. Sandra must show, however, that she attempted in good faith to comply with her obligation. So since there is substantial performance in good faith, Although Sandra delivered only 400 bags of cement, the obligation is deemed to have been complied with or as a result, the obligation will be extinguished as an exception to the general rule that the obligation should be completely delivered or rendered. Now let us go to the second exception. Incomplete or irregular performance is waived. So this is provided for under Article 1235 of the Civil Code. So the requisites are 
the obligee knows that the performance is incomplete or irregular. And he accepts the performance without expressing any protest or objection. So to understand this exception better, let us have an example. Oscar agreed to paint the house of Carlos. According to their agreement, Oscar would use boysen and color blue in painting the house of Carlos. However, instead of painting a color blue and using the boysen brand, Oscar painted white using the brand Davis. So again, in the obligation, Oscar obliges himself or agreed to paint the house of Carlos with color blue using the brand of Boysen. But instead of following the obligation or instead of complying with the obligation, Oscar painted white using the brand of Davis. So, let us see, for example, when Carlos learned that Oscar painted white using the brand of Davis on his house, he accepted the performance without expressing any protest or objection, meaning to say, hindi siya nagreklamo sa ginawa ni Oscar. So, under Article 1235, when the obligee accepts the performance, knowing its incompleteness or irregularity, and without expressing any protest or objection, the obligation is deemed fully complied with. Therefore, the obligation is extinguished. As an exception to the general rule that the performance of the obligation should be completely delivered or rendered. So, let us go to the other topics under payment or performance. So, we have uh, four topics here. Number one is who shall pay the obligation. So this uh, pertains to the person liable to pay the obligation. Second is, to whom payment shall be made. So kanino ka dapat magbayad ng uh, yung utang or magperform ng obligation. How payment shall be made. Paano ba bayaran yung obligation. At place of payment. So where is the place of payment. So, saan ba uh, yung utang or yung obligation babayaran? So, let us uh, discuss them one by one. So, who shall pay the obligation? Under Article 1236, the following persons may pay the obligation and for which the creditor is bound to accept payment. Number one, the debtor. So, of course, uh, since uh, it is the debtor who uh, oblige himself you know, to perform the obligation. So primarily, he is the person uh, liable to pay the obligation. Second, any person who has interest in the obligation. For example, a guarantor. So if a person, though he is not the debtor in the obligation, if he has an interest in the obligation, then he can pay the entire obligation. And for which the creditor is bound to accept payment. Meaning to say, the creditor cannot um, refuse to accept payment from a person who has an interest in the obligation. Third, a third person who has no interest in the obligation when there is stipulation that he can make payment. So in short, even if the person does not have an interest in the obligation but he is authorized to pay the obligation, then uh, the creditor is bound to accept payment from that third person. So under Article 1239, in obligations to give, 
payment made by one who does not have the free disposal of the thing due and capacity to alienate it shall not be valid without prejudice to the provisions of Article 1427 under the title on natural obligation. So, what are the uh, the the principle provided for under Article 1239? So, the principle are or the principles are free disposal of the thing due and capacity to alienate. Meaning to say, the person paying the obligation, uh, um, uh, uh, it means to say rather that the thing to be delivered must not be subject to any claim or lien or encumbrance of a third person. Meaning to say, the thing is not subject to encumbrance or claim or lien by any other person it is free no it is free to be disposed or and secondly capacity to alienate it means that the person has the capacity to enter into contracts So what is the effect of payment by a third person? So we said earlier that uh, the persons who may pay the obligation are the debtor because he is the one primarily liable for the obligation or any person who has an interest in the obligation such as the guarantor because the extinguishment or the payment of the obligation will benefit him if he will pay the obligation. Third, a third person who has no interest in the obligation when there is stipulation that he can make payment, meaning, meaning to say he is authorized to make payment. But what if, for example, a third person pays the obligation in this third item, what is the effect? So let us proceed to the next slide. Effect of payment by a third person. So the rules are as follows. Number one, if made without the knowledge or against the will of the debtor, meaning to say, hindi alam ni debtor or kahit alam ni debtor pero ayaw niya, it is against his will, the effect is that the payer, the third person, can recover from the debtor only in so far as the payment has been beneficial to the latter or we call it the right of reimbursement. However, the second rule is if made with the knowledge of the debtor, kapag alam ni debtor, then the payer shall have the rights of reimbursement and subrogation. That is, to recover what he has paid and to acquire all the rights of the creditor. So aside from the right of reimbursement, the third person will also acquire the right of subrogation. So, in order to understand uh, these provisions better, let us have an example. Sandra owes Brenda the sum of 1,000 pesos. If Candy, a stranger to the obligation or a third person, offers to pay Brenda, Brenda may or may not accept the offer of payment. Why? Because Candy is a is a third person to the obligation. And it does not also provide that Candy has the authority to make payment. So therefore, let us not presume that particular fact. No? So, so meaning to say, since Candy is a stranger or a third person, and it appears in the problem that she is not authorized to make payment, then Brenda cannot be bound to accept the offer of payment. Because let, let's go back to the principle. Who are those persons who can pay the obligation and for which the creditor is bound to accept payment? Di ba sabi natin, yung first, yung debtor, kasi siya yung primarily liable. Second is any person who has interest in the obligation, such as the guarantor. And third, a third person, although he has no interest in the obligation, but if he has the authority to make payment, then the creditor is bound to accept payment. So let us go back to the example. In the given example, it does not appear or it does not say that Candy has the authority to 
make payment to Brenda. Therefore, Brenda cannot be compelled to accept the payment of Candy. But suppose Brenda accepts. Let us say, tinanggap ni Brenda yung payment ni Candy. Ano ngayon yung right ni Candy? So the right of Candy to recover depends upon whether the payment is with or without knowledge or consent of Sandra. So, if the payment is without the knowledge or consent of Sandra, if the actual indebtedness is 1,000 pesos and Sandra paid, uh, Candy rather paid 1,000, she can ask reimbursement for 1,000 pesos. But if 400 pesos had already been paid by Sandra, then Candy is entitled to be reimbursed only for the amount of 600 pesos because it is only to that amount that Candy or that Sandra has been benefited. So Candy can recover 400 pesos from Brenda who should not have accepted it. If Brenda acted in bad faith, Brenda is liable also for interest in lieu of damages. However, if the payment of Candy is with the knowledge of Sandra, in either case, if the payment of 1,000 was made with the knowledge or consent of Sandra, Candy can recover from Sandra 1,000 pesos with all the rights of subrogation to the accessory obligations such as mortgage, guarantee, or penalty. So let us distinguish now subrogation and reimbursement. We mentioned earlier that if the payment made by a third person is without the knowledge or against the will of the debtor, what is acquired by the third person is only the right of reimbursement insofar as the payment has been beneficial to the debtor. However, if the payment is made with the knowledge of the debtor, then the third person paying the obligation shall have the right of subrogation in addition to the right of reimbursement. So, let us now distinguish subrogation and reimbursement. Under the law, Subrogation, or in subrogation, the person who pays for the debtor is put into the shoes of the creditor. The payer acquires not only the right to be reimbursed for he has paid, but all, also all the other rights which the creditor could have exercised pertaining to the credit either against the debtor or against third persons, be they guarantors or possessors of mortgages. But in reimbursement, the third person entitled by reason of payment has merely the bare right to be refunded to the extent provided in the second paragraph of Article 1236 without the right to the guarantees and securities of the original obligation. In subrogation, there is no real extinction of the obligation but only a change of creditor. So the third person paying the debt, diba we said that, he is put into the shoes of the creditor and therefore the third person paying the debt with the knowledge of the debtor uh, uh, will become the new creditor because he acquired the right of subrogation. So let us have an example. Sandra borrowed from Brenda 10,000 pesos. So girly here is the guarantor. So, let's take these scenarios. Number one, what if, for example, Kindy paid uh, Brenda 10,000 pesos without knowledge or consent of Sandra? So, what is the effect? In this case, Kindy can claim reimbursement from Sandra for the whole amount of 10,000 pesos in as much as Sandra was benefited up to that amount. If Sandra cannot pay Candy, the latter cannot proceed against 
girly, the guarantor, even if Brenda is willing because having paid without the consent of Sandra, Candy is not entitled to subrogation. But let us say the payment made by Candy to Brenda is with the knowledge and consent of Sandra. What is the effect? If the payment was with the express or tacit approval of Sandra, Candy would be entitled not merely to full reimbursement, but also to subrogation. So let us say, for example, the obligation of Sandra is secured by a mortgage of a land owned by Sandra. Payment by Candy without the knowledge or against the will of Sandra cannot give Candy the right of subrogation. So Candy can recover only insofar as the payment has been beneficial to Sandra. But if the payment is with the knowledge or consent of Sandra, then Candy will not only acquire the right of reimbursement, but, but also the right of subrogation, which is the mortgage. So let's go to payment by a third person who does not intend to be reimbursed. Article 1238 provides that payment made by a third person who does not intend to be reimbursed by the debtor is deemed to be a donation, which requires the debtor's consent. But the payment is in any case valid as to the creditor who has accepted it. 1238 embodies the idea that no one should be compelled to accept the generosity of another. If the paying third person does not intend to be reimbursed, the payment is deemed a donation which requires the debtor's consent to be valid. However, if the creditor accepts the payment, it shall be valid as to him and the payer although the debtor did not give his consent to the donation. So let us have an example. Sandra owes Brenda the sum of 10,000 pesos. Without the intention of being reimbursed, ayan, nandiyan na naman si Candy. Candy paid Sandra's obligation. But Candy has no intention to be reimbursed. Sandra had previously accepted Candy's generosity. So sabi ni Sandra, okay, sige. Okay ako dyan. Binayaran ni Candy yung aking utang. So in this case, Sandra is not liable to Candy and his obligation is extinguished. But what if, for example, Sandra did not give her consent to the donation? Although, so what is the effect? So, Candy may recover from Sandra the amount of 10,000 pesos since there has been no valid donation. Although, originally, Candy did not intend to be reimbursed. Nevertheless, the obligation of Sandra to Brenda is extinguished because the payment is valid as to Brenda, who has accepted it. So, let's go to the next topic, to whom payment shall be made. So, kanina, kanino ka magbabayad ng iyong obligation? So, let's proceed. Under Article 1240, payment shall be made to the person in whose favor the obligation has been constituted or his successor in interest or any person authorized to receive it. So, let us dissect this particular provision, payment shall be made to, number one, the creditor or obligee, meaning to say, the person in whose favor the obligation has been constituted. However, take note of Article 1243, which states that payment made to the creditor by the debtor after the latter has been judicially ordered to retain the debt shall not be valid. Second, 
his successor in interest like an heir or assignee. So this will happen only if the creditor or the obligee is already dead. So uh, by, by rules of succession, her rights shall be transmitted to his or her. Uh, his rights shall be transmitted to his successor in interest or any person authorized to receive it. So uh, the creditor may authorize any person to receive the payment of the obligation. So for example, Sandra owes Brenda the sum of 10,000 pesos. So, in this particular problem, payment shall be made to Brenda because Brenda here is the creditor. But Brenda may authorize another person to receive the payment of Sandra. So, therefore, Sandra can validly pay to that authorized person. Or if Sandra is already dead, then payment may be made to, I, sorry, if Brenda rather, okay, again, in this particular problem, applying Article 1240, Sandra should pay to Brenda because Brenda here is the creditor or the obligee. Unless, unless under Article 1243, Sandra is judicially ordered to retain the debt. So therefore, any payment to Brenda will not be valid, but uh, that is only an exception to the rule. The general rule is payment should be made to the creditor, and the creditor here is Brenda. So payment should be made to Brenda. But if Brenda is already dead, then since the rights of Brenda will be transmitted to her heirs, so payment should be made to her successor in interest. Or, Brenda may authorize any person to receive the payment from Sandra. So, in such case, Sandra can validly make payment to such authorized person. So, who is the creditor? The creditor referred to must be the creditor at the time the payment is to be made, not at the constitution of the obli. Gation. Hence, if a person is subrogated to the right of the creditor, payment should be made to the new creditor. So, for example, if Sandra owes Brenda the sum of 10,000 pesos without knowledge and uh, with knowledge and consent of Sandra, Candy paid Brenda 10,000 pesos. So, diba, remember uh, the, the rule if a third person pays the obligation with knowledge and consent of the debtor. We said a while ago that the effect is that the, the third person will acquire not only the right of reimbursement, but also the right of subrogation. So therefore, if that is the case, Candy will become the new creditor. So if Candy becomes the new creditor and the obligation becomes due and demandable, then Sandra should pay to Candy because Candy is the new creditor. So the rule says that the creditor referred to must be the creditor at the time the payment is to be made and not at the constitution of the obligation. So in the given example, at the time of the constitution of the obligation, the creditor was Brenda. But when Candy paid the entire obligation with knowledge and consent of Sandra, Candy became the new creditor. Therefore, payment should be made to Candy when the obligation becomes due and demandable. So what about any person authorized to receive it? So what is the meaning of that uh, phrase? As used in Article 1240, it means not only a person authorized by the creditor, but also a person authorized by law to receive the payment, such as a guardian, executor, or administrator of the estate of a deceased, 
and assignee or liquidator of a partnership or a corporation as well as any other person who may be authorized to do so by law. So what if, for example, the payment was made to an incapacitated person? So what is the effect? Under Article 1241, Payment to a person who is incapacitated to administer his property shall be valid if he has kept the thing delivered or in so far as the payment has been beneficial to him. Payment made to a third person shall also be valid in so far as it has redounded to the benefit of the creditor. Such benefit to the creditor need not be proved in the following cases. Number one, if after the payment the third person acquires the creditor's rights. Number two, if the creditor ratifies the payment to the third person. Number three, if by the creditor's conduct, the debtor has been led to believe that the third person had authority to receive payment. So let us have an example. Sandra delivers 1,000 pesos to Brenda, who is a minor under guardianship, in payment of a debt. So, binayaran ni Sandra si Brenda ng 1,000 pesos. Si Brenda ay isang minor under guardianship. So, for example, Brenda loses 700 pesos of the money in gambling or due to negligence or ignorance. So, in this case, the payment should be considered as made only to the extent of 300 pesos. On the other hand, if... Um, Brenda kept the money paid or spent it for purposes useful to him, the payment shall be valid. Otherwise, Brenda would unduly enrich herself at the expense of Sandra. So again, in the given example, since Brenda loses the 700 pesos of the money in gambling or due to her negligence or ignorance, then the payment of Sandra will only be valid to the extent of 300 pesos because under the law, generally, payment to a person incapacitated to administer or manage his property is not valid. So, that uh, applying the general rule, ang na-extinguish lang based on the payment is up to 300 pesos because the general rule says that if the person is incapacitated to administer or manage his property, any payment made to him shall not be valid. But the exception is if that person, that incapacitated person, kept the thing paid or delivered or was benefited by the payment. So again, for example, if instead of uh, losing the 700 pesos money in gambling, Brenda to, uh, kept the 1,000 pesos for herself and um, spent it for something useful for her. So in that case, the exception to the rule will apply. So if the exception to the rule will apply, then the entire 1,000 pesos will be considered as a valid payment. So what is the effect of payment to a third person? Uh, let us review, di ba? Sino nga yung mga persons na dapat mong bayaran ng obligation? Number one, we said that payment should be made to the creditor or obligee. Number two, his successor or interest or successor in interest. Number three, any person authorized to receive it. What if, for example, payment was made to a third person? So what is the effect now? The general rule is that payment to third person or wrong party is not valid. But the exceptions are, number one, insofar as it has redounded to the benefit of the creditor. And second is, under Article 1242, when payment made in good faith to any person in possession of the credit shall release the debtor. So let us discuss the first exception in so far as it has redounded to the benefit of the creditor. What is the rule? The fact that the payment has redounded to the benefit 
feet of the creditor must be proven. So it must not be So it is not presumed. It must be satisfactorily established by the person interested in by the person interested. Or meaning to say um, the fact that the payment has redounded to the benefit of the creditor must be proven or must be established. So hindi dapat a presume. But there are exceptions to the rule. Number one, if after the payment, the third person acquires the creditor's rights, meaning to say, um, the third person has acquired the right of the creditor. Therefore, there is no need to prove that the payment has redounded to the benefit of the creditor because the third person became the new creditor. Second, if the creditor ratifies the payment to the third person, for example, um, the payment was made to the third person, Generally, diba, we said that the payment is not valid. But if, for example, the creditor says that it's okay, meaning he um, ratified or he agreed that the payment be made to the third person, then there is no need to prove that the payment has redounded to the creditor's benefit. And lastly, if by the creditor's conduct, the debtor has led to believe that the third person had authority to receive the payment. So, this is um, a case of estopel, which means that the the, the admission or representation made by the creditor is rendered conclusive upon the person making it and cannot be denied or disproved as against the person relying thereon, which means that if uh, by uh, through the act of the creditor, the debtor has been led to believe that the third person had authority to receive the payment, then uh, the creditor cannot anymore deny or disprove that that such third person had no authority to receive the payment. So let us say, for example, uh, D is indebted to C in the amount of 1,000 pesos. On the date of the maturity of the obligation, payment was made by D to a third person. So in this case, D is still liable to C. Why? Because applying the general rule, payment to third person or wrong party is not valid. If T or the third person delivered 700 pesos to C, the payment by D is valid only to the extent of 700 pesos. But D must prove the delivery of 700 pesos to C. Such proof, however, is not necessary if after payment, the third person acquired the rights of C against D. Or if C has ratified or subsequently consented to the payment of the third person. Or if before payment, D has been led to believe by C's conduct or fault that the third person had authority to receive the payment even if the third person had, in fact, no such authority. So let's go to the next exception under Article 1242. This article gives another instance when there is valid payment to a third person. So, take note here that the possession, okay, the term possession referred to under the provision of Article 1242 is possession of the credit itself. 
yung utang mismo and not merely of the document or instrument evidencing the credit. Hence, mere possession of the instrument does not entitle the holder to payment nor does payment release the debtor. Furthermore, the payer must act in good faith, that is, in the honest belief that he is making a valid payment and that the payee is the owner of the credit and good faith here is presumed. So let us have an example. Let us say, for example, I am indebted to you in the amount of 1,000 pesos. And as, uh, as an evidence of such indebtedness, we executed a promissory note. And I signed the promissory note. So sabi ko sa promissory note na I promise to pay you 1,000 pesos. However, ikaw, you lost the promissory note. Nawala mo yung promissory note. And that promissory note was later found by a third person. So, so ngayon, yung third person ang may hawak ng promissory note. Si third person ngayon pumunta sa akin. Sabi niya, Madam, Bayaran mo ako ng iyong utang na nandito sa promissory note. Kasi sabi mo, you promised to pay 1,000 pesos. Ako ngayon ang may hawak ng promissory notes. Dapat magbayad ka sa akin. So what is uh, the rule under Article 1242? If I will pay the amount of 1,000 pesos to the third person in possession of the promissory note, the law says that the payment made is not valid because the third person is the possessor merely of the document evidencing the credit and not of the credit itself. Although nasa kanya yung promissory note, pero hindi naman talaga siya yung owner ng credit. Hindi siya yung creditor. And therefore, sabi ng batas, dapat yung possession is yung sa credit, hindi yung instrument. So, any payment made to a third person in possession of the instrument only and not of the credit, then will not, it, such payment will not be valid so as to extinguish the obligation. But what if, for example, Instead of losing the promissory note, ikaw na creditor, inassign mo. Meaning to say, binenta mo yung promissory note sa third person. Kumbaga, inassign mo yung credit mo sa third person. So, binayaran ka ngayon ni third person, let us say, binayaran ka niya ng 1,000 pesos. So, si third person na ngayon ang nagmamayari ng, ng utang, ng credit itself. And, Aside from possessing the credit itself, he is now in possession of the promissory note, which is the instrument evidencing the credit. So what if ngayon, si third person, pumunta siya sa akin. Sabi niya, Madam, bayarin mo ako ngayon ng utang mo sa promissory note kasi ako na ngayon ang may-ari ng utang na ito. Kasi inassign sa akin or binenta sa akin ito ng creditor. So, since the third person is in possession of the credit itself and not merely of the document or instrument evidencing the credit, any payment to him shall be valid and therefore it shall release the debtor and extinguish the obligation. As an exception to the general rule that Payment to third person or wrong party is not valid. So, let's go back to the topics. How payment shall be made? So, paano ba babayaran yung obligation? So, let's proceed. Under Article 1246, when the obligation consists in the delivery of an indeterminate or generic thing, whose quality and circumstances have not been stated, the creditor cannot demand a thing of superior quality, neither can the debtor deliver a thing of inferior quality. 
the purpose of the obligation and other circumstances shall be taken into consideration. For example, Sandra promised to deliver to Brenda a bag. So, it is, the bag here is an indeterminate or generic thing because it does not specify what brand of bag or what is the size of the bag, where should the bag be bought, etc. So, meaning to say, there is a mere uh, general description of the bag. It only says bag. So, therefore, the object here, the thing here is indeterminate or generic because you cannot physically segregate or particularly uh, identify which bag is the subject of the obligation. So, sabi ng Article 246, or applying Article 246, Brenda cannot compel Sandra to deliver a high-end coach bag. Kasi hindi naman sinabi sa obligation na coach bag yung i-deliver. Kasi generic yung description ng bag. So, hindi pwedeng mag-demand ngayon si Brenda na coach, high-end na coach bag yung i-deliver mo sa akin. And neither can Sandra require Brenda to accept a used old bag. So, hindi rin pwedeng i-deliver ni Sandra yung inferior quality ng bag. So, under Article 1247, unless it is otherwise stipulated, the extra judicial expenses required by the payment shall be for the account of the debtor. With regard to judicial costs, the rules of court shall govern. So, so yung magbabayad pala ng extrajudicial expenses for the payment of the debt, ang debtor pala yung magsha-shoulder ng expenses na yan. So, performance of the obligation should be complete under Article 1248 unless there is an express stipulation to that effect. The creditor cannot be compelled partially to receive the prestations in which the obligation consists. Neither may the debtor be required to make partial payments. However, when the debt is in part liquidated and in part unliquidated, the creditor may demand and the debtor may effect the payment of the former without waiting for the liquidation of the latter. So, under Article 1248, you cannot compel the, the debtor to make partial payment of the obligation and neither can the creditor be compelled to accept partial payment. Kasi nga, di ba, uh, the principle of um, integrity says that uh, the performance of the obligation or the payment or performance of the obligation must be complete. Dapat kompleto. Walang partial payment. Okay? So, so, yun yung general rule. So, let us have an example. Sandra is indebted to Brenda for 5,000 pesos due today. So, applying Article 1248, Sandra cannot compel Brenda to receive 4,000 in partial payment of the obligation. So, hindi pwedeng sabihin ni Sandra na, Brenda, 4,000 lang yung babayarin ko. Tanggapin mo to. Hindi niya pwedeng pilitin si Brenda. And neither Brenda can, uh, and neither can Brenda require Sandra to pay only 4,000 pesos unless there is an agreement to the contrary. So, unless na lang um, si Brenda mag-agree siya na 4,000 lang partial payment, okay lang yun. Pero kung ayaw niya, hindi mo siya pwedeng pilitin. Si Sandra naman, hindi pa rin pilitin ni Brenda na 4,000 lang yung ibabayad. Baka maraming pera, maraming pera si Sandra, no? may marami siyang pera. So, mas maganda yung bayaran niya, yung entire obligation. So, Brenda cannot say to Sandra na 4,000 lang yung bayaran mo. Kasi nga, you, the creditor cannot, um, cannot require the debtor to make partial payments kasi the performance or the payment of the obligation should be complete. Unless na lang if the debt is in part liquidated in part unliquidated. So, how payment shall be made under Article 1249? O kanina, pinag-usapan natin is if the obligation consists in the delivery of an indeterminate or generic thing. What if, for example, the obligation is uh, consists in the delivery of money? So, under Article 1249, 
the payment of debts in money shall be made in the currency stipulated and if it is not possible to deliver such currency then in the currency which is legal tender in the Philippines the delivery of a promissory note payable to order or bills of exchange or other mercantile documents shall produce the effect of payment only when they have been cashed or when through the fault of the creditor they have been impaired in the meantime the action derived from the original obligation shall be held in the abeyance. Now, what is legal tender? Legal tender is that currency which, is, which, if offered by the debtor in the right amount, the creditor must accept in payment of a debt in money. So, simply, simply put, when you say legal tender, it is the currency which can be uh, accepted as a mode of exchange so for example if you will buy a t-shirt in the mall so you should uh, pay uh, you should uh, pay something in exchange right and in paying something in exchange you should use uh, that currency which can be acceptable as a mode of exchange so in the philippines the currency which is acceptable as a mode of exchange is the Philippine Peso. So therefore, if you will buy a t-shirt in the mall, you cannot, uh, you cannot exchange a, a grocery item or you cannot deliver a grocery item in exchange because, because a grocery item cannot be accepted as a mode of exchange. So, and, and it is not a currency. So therefore, when you say legal tender, yan yung currency na acceptable in a in a commercial transaction as a mode of exchange. Yung tatanggapin nila para makabili ka ng something. But if a currency can be accepted as a mode of exchange, then that particular currency is not considered as a legal tender. In the Philippines, all coins and notes issued by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas constitute legal tender for all debts, both public or private. So, what if, for example, the, the payment uh, was made by delivering a promissory note? or payment by means of instruments of credits. Example, promissory note, checks, bills of exchange, and other commercial documents. Generally, if you will deliver instruments of credit, such as promissory note, checks, bills of exchange, and other commercial documents, the creditor cannot be compelled to accept them. Bakit? Because they are not legal tender. So, pwedeng i-refuse ni creditor i-accept yung cheque as a payment. But, if for, for example, the creditor will uh, accept the payment of a cheque, then the law says that it will not produce the effect of payment until such uh, instrument have been cashed or when through the fault of the creditor, they have been impaired. So yung cheque, eh, kailangan ipa-deposit mo muna yan doon sa bank or ipa-encash mo muna yan before it has the effect of payment. So at the time of the delivery of the check, hindi pa considered bayad yung utang or hindi pa considered valid yung payment. Saka lang mag -e effect yung payment kapag na-encash na yung cheque. Eh. Or when through the fault of the creditor, yung cheque na impair. For example, nawala ni creditor yung cheque. So, sino ba ang may kasalanan? Di ba si creditor? So, dahil sa kanyang kasalanan, nawala niya yung cheque, dahil nawala niya yung cheque, hindi niya mapa-encash yun, di ba? So, therefore, it will now have the effect of payment so as to extinguish the obligation. But, but then again, generally, the delivery of instruments of credit such as a promissory note, a bills of exchange, or other mercantile document, uh, the best example is yung cheque, 
hindi siya uh, legal tender, kaya hindi hindi mo pwedeng i-compel o hindi mo pwedeng pilitin si creditor na i-accept yung delivery ng mga instruments of credit. Pero, if yung creditor in-accept niya yung instrument of credit, such as, for example, yung cheque kanina, then it will only produce the effect of payment if it has already been cashed or through, if through the fault of the creditor, it has been impaired. So, take note of that principle. So, uh, let's go back to the topics. Ayan, place of payment. So, place of payment under Article 1251, payment shall be made in the place designated in the obligation. There being no express stipulation, and if the undertaking is to deliver a determinate thing, the payment shall be made wherever the thing might be at the moment the obligation was constituted. In any other case, the place of payment shall be the domicile of the debtor. If the debtor changes his domicile in bad faith or after he has incurred in delay, the additional expenses shall be borne by him. These provisions are without prejudice to venue under the rules of court. So, let us uh, explain this by way of example. So, Sandra obliged herself, uy, mali, dapat herself, no, to deliver to Brenda a specific refrigerator. Take note here that the thing subject of the obligation is a determinate thing or a specific thing. It was agreed that the refrigerator shall be delivered at Brenda's house. So, let us go back to the provision of Article 1251. Sabi ng Article 1251, payment daw shall be made in the place designated in the obligation. Which means that if the parties have agreed a specific place of payment, then payment should be made in that specific place. So, balikan natin yung example. Sa example, it appears na merong agreement si Sandra at Brenda na yung payment shall be made at Brenda's house or the performance of the obligation should be made at Brenda's house. So therefore, since there is a place designated in the obligation, then payment or performance of the obligation should be made in that place. So since nag-agree si Sandra at Brenda na yung, yung refrigerator, yung specific refrigerator, i-deliver sa bahay ni Brenda, so dapat, doon dapat i-deliver ni Sandra yung specific refrigerator. What if, for example, hindi na pagkasunduan ni Sandra at Brenda kung saan i-deliver yung specific refrigerator. Balikan natin yung Article 1251. There being no express stipulation, and if the undertaking is to deliver a determinate thing, the payment shall be made wherever the thing might be at the moment the obligation was constituted. Which means that kung daw yung subject matter ng obligation is a specific or determinate thing, ang pagbabayad ng utang or pag-deliver ng obligation shall be made kung saan yung thing at the moment the obligation was constituted. So let us say, for example, yung specific refrigerator is um, placed in the house of Sandra. Nasa bahay ni Sandra yung specific refrigerator. And let us say, for example, hindi nag-agree si Sandra at Brenda as to the place of payment. So, ano yung sagot? Saan ba i-deliver yung refrigerator? So, applying Article 1251, second paragraph, the place or the payment shall be made wherever the thing might be at the moment the obligation was constituted. So, meaning to say,
meaning to say the payment shall be made in the house of Sandra. So, it appears, therefore, na si Brenda pala yung kukuha ng specific refrigerator sa bahay ni Sandra. Kasi nga, yung specific refrigerator ay nasa bahay ni Sandra at the moment the obligation was constituted. What if, for example, hindi siya specific refrigerator? Pero si generic thing siya or indeterminate thing. Ano yung rule? Balik tayo sa Article 1251. In any other case, the place of payment shall be the domicile of the debtor. Sa bahay daw ng debtor. So, in the given example, kunyari yung, yung thing is a generic thing or indeterminate refrigerator, then the place of payment is in the domicile of the debtor who is Sandra. No? So in this case, since Sandra is a debtor, the place of payment is at Sandra's domicile or at Sandra's residence. So let's go to the special forms of payment. General rule. In order for the payment to be valid, the thing or service must be completely delivered or rendered as the case may be, no? based on the principle of integrity. Another rule, the very prestation due must be delivered or performed based on the principle of identity. But then again, these principles are merely the general rules. So therefore, there are exceptions to the rule. And what are those? Number one, dation in payment under Article 245. Number two, application of payments under Article 1253. Number three, payment by session under Article 1255. And lastly, tender of payment and consignation. So let us discuss first dation in payment. What is dation in payment or adjudication or dation in and pago? So dation in payment is the conveyance of ownership of a thing as an accepted equivalent of performance. It is a special form of payment because it is not the ordinary way of extinguishing an obligation. For example, Sandra owes Brenda 30,000 pesos. To fulfill the obligation, Sandra, with the consent of Brenda, delivers a piano. So if you can notice in the given example, the obligation or the, the primary obligation of Sandra is to deliver an amount equivalent to 30,000 pesos, right? However, when Sandra fulfilled her obligation, she, instead of delivering 30,000 pesos, she delivered a piano, which is an object, which is a thing. So, if there is an agreement, if, if Brenda will consent to it, then the entire obligation of Sandra amounting to 30,000 pesos is now extinguished. So, wala na siyang obligation. Kasi, meron ng uh, dation in payment. What if, for example, yung value ng piano is less than 30,000 pesos? What will happen to the obligation of Sandra? Under Article 1245, Article 1245, the conveyance of ownership of a thing, it will be accepted as an equivalent performance of the obligation. So, we need to say, even if the value of the piano is less than 30,000, it will be considered as an accepted equivalent of the performance of the obligation. And therefore, Brenda can no longer demand from Sandra the difference between the value of the piano and the 30,000 pesos because it is as if that the piano will be the equivalent performance of the obligation. So, so yun ang mangyayari. Kahit na bababa yung value ng piano kesa sa 30,000 pesos, if nag-consent naman si Brenda, 
considered na na-extinguish na yung entire obligation. Hindi na pwedeng uh, mag-demand si Brenda for the difference in value. So that is the effect of lation in payment. Ayan. Application of payments. So ano itong application of payments? Application of payments is the designation of the debt to which should be applied the payment made by a debtor who has various debts of the same kind in favor of one and the same creditor. So let us discuss the requisites. Number one, there must be one debtor and one creditor. So isa lang yung debtor, isa lang din yung creditor. Number two, there must be two or more debts. So hindi lang isa yung utang, kundi marami. Two or more. Number three, the debts must be of the same kind. Meaning to say, kung pera yung utang, pera lahat. Kung, kung for example, rice yung object ng utang, edi rice lahat. Okay? Dapat same kind. Fourth, the debts to which payment made by the debtor has been applied must be due. So, dapat nag na yung utang. And lastly, the payment made must not be sufficient to cover all the debts. Kasi kapag mababayaran mo naman pala lahat yung utang, no need to apply payment. Yung application of payment, nag apply lang yan kapag yung binayad mo is kulang pa para bayaran mo lahat ng utang mo sa creditor. So, uh, dahil kulang yung payment mo, kailangan mong mamili which among the debts yung babayaran mo. So, ano yung rules on application of payments? As to which debt is paid, the rules are as follows. Number one, the debtor has the first choice. He must indicate at the time of making payment and not afterwards which particular debt is being paid. If, in making use of his right, the debtor applied the payment to a debt, he cannot later claim that it should be applied to another debt. So, ano ibig sabihin nito? So, kapag nagbayad ngayon si debtor ng kanyang utang at kulang yung kanyang pagbaya, pambayad sa lahat ng utang niya kay creditor, pwede siya ang mamili kung anong utang yung uunahin niya. Okay? So, yan yung first na rule. At kapag nakapili na siya kung which debt is to be paid, then he can no longer change it. No? And say that, ay, itong isang utang ko na lang yung bayar. Hindi na pwede. Kasi under number two, the right to make the application once exercised is irrevocable unless the creditor consents to the change. We need to say, kapag nakapili ka na kung ano yung utang yung una mong babayaran, hindi mo na yun pwedeng i-change. Kasi nga, sabi ng batas, irrevocable siya. Third, if the debtor does not apply payment, so kung hindi siya namili kung anong utang yung unahin niya, then the creditor may make the designation by specifying in the receipt which debt is being paid. So, ang creditor ngayon ang mamimili kung anong utang yung uunahin na ma-extinguish. At i-specify niya yan sa resibo kung ano yung utang na in-apply sa payment ni debtor. Fourth, if the creditor has not also made the application, or if the application is not valid. So, we need to say, uh, si creditor, hindi siya pumili kung ano yung utang na babayaran. At kung nag-apply man siya ng payment, hindi siya valid. Then, yung debt, which is most onerous to the debtor, among those due shall be deemed to have been satisfied. We need to say, kung ano yung pinakamabigat na utang among the debts due, yun ang dapat unang bayaran. And lastly, if the debts due are of the same nature and burden, meaning to say lahat sila pare-pareho lang yung nature and burden, walang pinaka-onerous sa kanila. So ano ang application of payment? The payment shall be applied to all of them proportionately. So just remember the the words no, which are emphasized here. Yung first choice, irrevocable, specifying the receipt, most onerous and proportionately. 
so that you can remember how to apply no the rules on application of payment. So, let us have an illustration. Uh, Sandra owes Brenda as follows. So, maraming utang si Sandra. Di ba sabi natin, in application of payments, there are two or more debts. So, number one, yung una niyang utang is 1,500, which is payable on September 5. Second utang, 1,200 pesos payable on September 20. Third niya na utang is a specific transistor radio worth 2,000 to be delivered on September 20. And yung isa pa niyang utang, fourth na utang niya is 1,000 pesos payable on October 15. So, balikan muna natin yung requisites ha. Di ba sabi natin, there must be one debtor and one creditor. So, here, in the given example, isa lang yung debtor, isa lang din yung creditor, di ba? Kasi si Sandra lang yung debtor at si Brenda lang yung creditor. There must be two or more debts. Ayan, klaro naman sa problem na apat yung kanyang utang kay Brenda. The debts must be of the same kind. Ay, ito. Medyo meron tayong problema dito kasi yung third niya na utang is a specific transistor radio which is not of the same kind with her other debts, no? The 1,500, 1, 2, and 1,000. So therefore, uh, the rule on application of payment will not apply on the specific transistor radio kasi nga, hindi siya same kind with the other uh, obligation. Fourth, the debts to which payment made by the debtor has been applied must be due. Dapat nag-due na yung utang. So, malalaman natin later. And lastly, the payment made must not be sufficient to cover all the debts. So, in the given example, on September 20, Sandra paid 1,500 pesos to Brenda. So, take note that on September 20, ano yung mga utang na nag-due? Diba, in the given example, ang due na nautang is yung 1,500 tsaka yung 1,200 pesos. Kasi nga, nagbayad siya on September 20. So, therefore, yung utang lang na dapat i-cover or i-cover ng 1,500 pesos na payment ni Sandra is yung utang niya sa September 5 at September 20. Which has a total amount of 2,700 pesos. So, ano ngayon ang mangyayari? So, let us use the rules on application of payments. So, on September 20, Sandra may apply the 1,500 pesos payment to her debt on uh, to her debt which is due on September 5 which is 1500 pesos so so applying the first rule di ba the debtor has the first choice so so pwede na at the time of payment of 1500 sabihin ni Sandra na Brenda i-apply mo yung utang ko sa utang ko noong September 5 yung 1500 pesos pwede yun siya kasi yung first choice is kay debtor at kailangan i-indicate niya at the time of payment kung ano yung utang na pag-applyan niya sa kanyang payment. Or pwede din na sabihin ni Sandra na yung 1,500 ibayad dapat sa 1,200 na utang niya on September 20. And the remaining balance will be paid to her September 5 obligation. If Brenda will consent to it, no, kung, kung, kung okay lang kay Brenda. So, what if, for example, Sandra did not make a choice at the time of paying 1,500 to Brenda? So, hindi siya namili kung ano yung utang yung babayaran niya. Ano yung rule? 
abalikan muna natin yung first choice. Diba sabi natin kanina, kapag pinili na ni Sandra kung ano yung utang na pag-applyan niya sa kanyang payment, that will be irrevocable. So, what if for example, si Sandra, sabi niya, pagbayad niya kay Brenda, na Brenda, yung 1,500, i-apply mo yan sa utang ko noong September 5. So, once the choice has been made, Sandra can no longer change her choice. So, hindi niya pwedeng sabihin na, Bren ay Brenda, sa 1,2 na lang i-apply. Hindi pa di yun. So, that is uh, the second rule. Now, let's go to the third rule. What if, for example, hindi nag-apply si Sandra? Meaning to say, hindi niya sinabi kay Brenda kung ano yung utang na pag-applyan niya sa 1,500 pesos. So, ano yung mayayari? The creditor may make the designation by specifying the receipt which that is being paid. So, si Brenda ngayon na mamimili kung ano yung utang na Uh, pag-applyan niya sa 1,500 pesos na binayad ni Sandra. So, pwedeng sabihin ni Brenda na i-apply niya sa 1,500 na utang niya noong September 5 or pwedeng yung 1,500 i-apply niya sa September 20 na utang at yung remaining balance or yung excess amount shall be, shall be paid to the September 5 obligation. So what if, for example, if the creditor has not also made the application or the application is not valid, minito say hindi na mili si creditor kung ano yung utang na na pag-applyan niya sa payment ni Sandra, de ba? So ano yung rule? I-apply daw siya sa utang na most onerous or most burdensome, yung pinakamabigat na utang. So let us say, for example. Yung utang niya noong September 20 has 5% interest. So, sabihin natin na noong nagbayad si Sandra noong September 20, hindi niya sinabihan si Brenda kung saan i-apply yung 1,500. Si Brenda naman, hindi siya nag-apply ng payment. Hindi din siya namili, no? hindi siya nag-designate kung saan, kung saan niya ibayad yung 1,500. So, sabi ng batas, kapag yan ang nangyari, i-apply daw yung 1,500 sa utang na pinakamabigat. So, in the given problem, yung pinakamabigat na utang dito is yung merong interest. Kasi, kapag hindi niya nabayaran yung utang niya, September 20, that particular obligation will earn interest, no? As the time goes by. So, kapag hindi niya nabayaran, lalong mas lalaki yung kanyang utang. And therefore, such uh, obligation is burdensome, no? Or most onerous than the other obligations. So, saan dapat i-apply? So, i-apply dapat yung obligation sa 1,200 pesos on September 20. And the excess amount shall be applied to the September 5 obligation. But what if, for example, balik tayo sa kanina. Yung 1,500 pesos binayad ni Sandra kay Brenda. Hindi, nag, hindi nag-specify si Sandra kung saan i-apply yung 1,500. Si Brenda naman, hindi naman niya dinesignate kung anong utang yung babayaran with 1,500 pesos. Ngayon, yung utang is of the same nature and burden. Meaning, Parehos lang sila, walang interest. So sabi ng batas, payment shall be applied to all of them proportionately. So hatiin yung 1,500 in proportion. So let us say, uh, 1,500 will be divided uh, into the, uh, parang ano siya, 1,200 divided by 2,700 times 1,500. Or, or 1,500 divided by 2,700 times 1,500. Para makuha mo yung proportionate share ng 1,500 on September 5 at 1,200 on September 20. Basta yung principle dito is that kapag same lang yung nature and burden ng obligations, 
the payment shall be applied to all of them proportionately. So let's go to payment by session. So payment by session is another special form of payment. It is the assignment or abandonment of all the properties of the debtor for the benefit of his creditors in order that the latter may sell the same and apply the proceeds thereof to the satisfaction of their credits. So let us discuss the requisites of payment by session. Number one, there must be two or more creditors. Number two, the debtor must be partially insolvent. Meaning to say, uh, the debtor has the incapacity to pay all of his obligations. Number three, the assignment must involve all the properties of the debtor. So lahat ng properties ni debtor yung subject matter ng payment by session. And the session must be accepted by the creditors. So let us have an example. So ano yung effect ng payment by session? Unless there is a stipulation to the contrary, the assignment does not make the creditors the owners of the property of the debtor. And the debtor is released from his obligation only up to the net proceeds of the sale of the property assigned. In other words, the debtor is still liable if there is a balance. So to better illustrate this, I will give you an example. So let us say, for example, Sandra has an obligation to these four persons. So, itong apat na ito is on the, on the right side are the creditors. So, di ba, let's go back to the elements of payment by session. There must be two or more creditors. So, kung isa lang yung creditor, hindi mag-apply yung payment by session. Dapat at least two or more creditors. So, in, in the example given, apat sila. So, pwede complied yung first requisite. The debtor must be partially insolvent. So let us say, for example, na insolvent na si Sandra, meaning to say she can no longer pay her obligations no? when they fall due. So at let us say, for example, yung utang niya is 2 million pesos, yung total na utang niya from the four uh, creditors. So, number three, the assignment must involve all the properties of the debtor. So, lahat dapat ng properties niya kasali. And the session must be accepted by the creditor. So, let us say, for example, with the consent of his creditors, Sandra, okay, ayan, may assign his property to them to be sold to satisfy their credit. So, ang mangyari dito, lahat ng property ni Sandra i-assign niya ngayon sa mga creditors. Sabihin niya sa mga creditors na, hey creditors, kayo na ibenta niyo ang aking mga properties, okay? At kung ano man yung proceeds, ano man yung makita niyo from the sale of my properties, i-apply niyo yon sa aking obligation. Okay? So sabi ng batas, yung creditors to whom the assignment was made will not become the owners of the property. Anong, ano yung kanilang na-acquire lang is the right, to, uh, the right to sell the properties but not to become owners thereof. So, kung yan ang case, ibig sabihin, kapag yung proceeds ng utang ay nang, nang sale, is hindi enough to satisfy or to fully pay the obligation, then Sandra will still have to pay the balance thereof. Kasi nga, sabi ng batas, yung debtor, marirelease lang siya from obligation only up to the net proceeds of the sale. Kaya kung kulang yung proceeds ng sale, para bayaran yung utang, yung kulang will be paid by Sandra. However, if it is the other way around, yung proceeds ng sale is sobra sa utang, sa value ng utang, then yung sobra kailangan isauli nila kay Sandra. Kasi nga, the assignment of the properties, of all the properties of Sandra, does not make the creditors the owners of such property. 
the right that they have acquired is merely to sell the properties of Sandra and whatever proceeds that can be uh, made out of that sale will be applied to the obligation of Sandra. So that is uh, the effect of payment by session. Now, let us distinguish dation in payment and payment by session. Uh, if you can recall dation in payment, parang meron silang similarities with payment by session. However, they are really different no? in all respects. No? Kasi, nga, kasi nga, yung elements nila magkaiba din. So, let us now distinguish between the two. Number one, in addition in payment, there is only one creditor. So if you can recall, di ba, kanina, isa lang yung creditor dito. Isa lang din yung debtor. But in payment by session, isa ang debtor, but there are several creditors. In addition in payment, the debtor is not necessarily insolvent. Hindi necessary na wala na siyang capacity to pay all of his obligations. Ang importante lang sa addition in payment na may consent ni creditor. Na musugot si creditor na bayaran ni debtor ang utang pinaagi sa butang or sa Osaka property. But in payment by session, the debtor is insolvent at the time of assignment. Meaning to say, the debtor can no longer pay his obligations. Third, in addition in payment, it does not involve all the properties of the debtor. So, pwedeng isa lang na property or dalawa. But in payment by session, it extends to all the properties of the debtor subject to execution. So, lahat ng properties ni debtor, i-assign kay creditor para ibenta. Fourth, the debtor becomes the owner of the thing given by the debtor. Di ba remember, in addition in payment, yung, yung conveyance ng thing to the creditor will be accept will be considered as an accepted equivalent performance of the obligation so even if the value of the thing delivered by the debtor to the creditor through addition in payment is less than the amount of the obligation the obligation is still entirely extinguished kasi nga the creditor becomes the owner of the thing given by the debtor. So, by the way, uh, hindi yan debtor, creditor yan siya. But in payment by session, the creditors only acquire the right to sell the thing and apply the proceeds to their credits proportionately. Lastly, addition is really an act of novation because you are changing the object of the obligation. But in payment by session, no, it is not an act of novation. Now, let us go to our last topic for payment or performance, the tender of payment and consignation. So, what is tender of payment? It is the act on the part of the debtor of offering to the creditor the thing or amount due. So, meaning to say, if when you say tender of payment, uh, it is an act of uh, offering to the creditor that you will now pay the obligation or you will now perform your obligation. On the other hand, consignation is the act of depositing the thing or amount due with the proper court when the creditor does not desire or cannot receive it after complying with the formalities required by the law. So let's talk first about tender of payment requirements. Number one, it must comply with the rules on payment or with the terms required by the contract in making such tender. The tender, even if valid, does not by itself produce legal payment unless it is completed by consignation. So after you tender payment of the obligation, you should uh, also complete it by consigning the thing or the amount due to the proper judicial authorities in order to produce legal payment. Second, it must be unconditional and for the whole amount due and in legal tender. 
Third, it must be actually made. So, so therefore, the manifestation of a mere desire or intention to pay is not enough. The debtor must show present ability to perform by an actual offer of the thing or money due. So, what is the general rule here? There must be a valid tender of payment and refusal without justifiable reason by the creditor to accept it before a consignation can be made. So, meaning to say, si debtor dapat nag-offer na siya na bayaran niya yung utang and yung offer niya dapat hindi yon inaccept ni creditor without a justifiable reason. Bago siya mag perform ng consignation. However, there are exceptions to the general rule. Number one, when the creditor is absent or unknown or does not appear at the place of payment. So obviously, the debtor cannot consign, I, obviously, the debtor cannot make tender of payment kasi nga, wala, absent si creditor or his, uh, his whereabouts is unknown. Di ba? So, so he cannot make tender of payment. So, pwede na na diretso na to consignation. Second, when he is incapacitated to receive the payment at the time it is due, meaning to say, yung creditor, wala siyang capacity to receive the payment. So, in order to be prudent enough, the debtor can uh, automatically consign the thing or amount due to the proper judicial authorities without making a tender of payment. Kasi nga, in this particular scenario, tender of payment is useless, no? Kasi incapacitated si creditor to receive the payment. Third, when without just cause, he refuses to give receipt. For example, nagtender na si debtor ng payment, pero ayaw magbigay ng creditor ng resibo. So, nawala namang dahilan. So, ibig sabihin, tender of payment is no longer required. So, the debtor can can go to the judicial proper judicial authorities to consign the thing or amount you. Fourth, when two or more persons claim the same right to collect, so if may dalawa or may kit sa dalawang tao yung nag-claim sa payment. So, at yung debtor, hindi niya alam kung kanino siya magbabayad. So, therefore, if tender of payment is no longer required, the debtor can consign the thing or the amount due to the proper judicial authorities. And lastly, when the title of the obligation has been lost. Meaning to say, yung creditor, wala na siyang right over the obligation. So therefore, dahil hindi naman alam ni debtor kung sino na ngayon ang may right ng obligation, so no need na to make tender of payment. Pwede na na the debtor will consign the thing or the amount due to the proper judicial authority. So consignation, ano yung requisites? Number one, Existence of a valid debt. Second, tender of payment by the debtor and refusal without justifiable reason by the creditor to accept it. Sabi na, yung sinabi natin kanina. Previous notice of consignation to persons interested in the performance of the obligation. In the absence of prior notice to the persons interested in the fulfillment of the obligation, such as guarantors, mortgages, solidary debtors, solidary creditors, the consignation as payment shall be void. So, there should be a previous notice no, to all persons interested in the fulfillment of the obligation kasi yung effect niya, magiging void yung consignation. The purpose of the notice is to give the creditor a chance to reflect on his previous refusal to accept payment considering that the expenses of consignation shall be charged against him and that in case of loss of the thing consigned, he shall bear the risk of loss. So, ang rason daw kung bakit kailangan kang magbigay ng previous notice is para magkaroon ng second thought si creditor. Kasi, kasi previously, nag-refuse siya to accept no, the tender of payment without justifiable reason. Baka ngayon, kung magbigay ka ng notice na i-consign mo na siya, baka magbago yung isip niya at, at i-accept na niya yung tender of payment. Fourth, consignation of the thing or some due. So, me to say, you will now deposit the, the thing or the some due at the disposal of 
judicial authority. Number five, subsequent notice of consignation made to the interested parties. Meaning to say, after consigning the thing or the sum due to the proper judicial authority, the debtor should give a notice to the interested parties that the thing or the sum due had already been consigned to the proper judicial authorities. So how will you notify them, the interested parties? So you may fulfill it by service of summons no, upon the dependents, defendants together with a copy of the complaint. So the purpose of the second notice is to enable the creditor to withdraw the thing or sum deposited in case he accepts the consignation. So let us illustrate. Sandra owes Brenda a sum of money. On the due date of the obligation, Sandra offers to pay the obligation, but Brenda refuses to accept payment without any justifiable reason. So... In this case, Sandra's obligation will not be extinguished until she has made a valid consignation. The refusal by Brenda to accept the offer to pay without just cost will not have the effect of payment, but Sandra will be relieved from payment of any interest from the date of tender. So, hindi siya magbabayad ng interest from the date of tender of payment. Kasi kasalanan naman ni Brenda kung bakit natagalan yung pag-receive niya sa payment. Kasi siya naman yung dahilan, kaya hindi niya na-accept yung payment kasi nag-refuse siya without justifiable reason. Pero again, after tender of payment and refusal of the creditor to accept the payment without any justifiable reason, kailangan munang i-consign ni Sandra yung kanyang binayad sa proper judicial authority bago magkaroon ng valid payment so as to extinguish the obligation. Kasi yung rule is that tender of payment plus consignation. Unless na lang yung case falls under the exceptions that we have mentioned earlier wherein tender of payment is no longer necessary. So, uh, before we go to the withdrawal, who will bear now the expenses of consignation? Under Article 1259 of the Civil Code, the expenses of consignation when properly made shall be charged against the creditor. So, si creditor ngayon na magbabayad yung, yung expenses ng consignation. Ang reason is that kasalanan niya kasi kung bakit kinonsign yung amount due or thing due sa proper judicial authority. Kasi kung tinanggap niya lang yun, wala sanang consignation na mangyayari. So let's go to the withdrawal by the debtor of the thing or some deposited. So this is governed by Article 1260 and Article 1261. So under Article 1260, once the consignation has been duly made, the debtor may ask the judge to order the cancellation of the obligation. Before the creditor has accepted the consignation or before a judicial declaration that the consignation has been properly made, the debtor may withdraw the thing or the sum deposited, allowing the obligation to remain for. So, let me explain briefly you know, this particular article. So, kapag na-consign na daw yung thing or sum due sa proper judicial authority and the consignment was duly made, then the debtor now may ask the judge to order the cancellation of the obligation. And if uh, the order of cancellation had already been issued by the judge, then ang effect niyan sa obligation is that may extinguish na yung obligation. Okay? Kasi there is already a valid uh, payment of the obligation by tender and consignation. However, before the creditor has accepted the consignation or before a judicial declaration that the consignation has been properly made, 
si debtor, pwede niya pa rin i-withdraw yung thing or the sum deposited, allowing the obligation to remain in force. So, bago pa lang magkaroon ng judicial declaration or bago i-accept ni creditor yung consignation, pwede pa pa lang i-withdraw ni debtor yung thing or sum deposited. So, dahil withdraw niya yung thing or sum deposited, then mag yung obligation niya will remain in force. Meaning to say, it will not be extinguished kasi merong withdrawal. Article 1261, if the consignation having been made, the creditor should authorize the debtor to withdraw the same, he shall lose every preference which he may have over the thing. The co-debtors, guarantors, and surety shall be released. So, ang ibig sabihin lang nito is that If, for example, na-consign na yung thing or amount due sa proper judicial authority and thereafter, sabi ni creditor, debtor, i-withdraw mo yung, ano, yung, yung sum or thing due na dineposit mo sa proper judicial authorities. So, ang mangyayari niyan is that si creditor, mawawala na siya ngayon ng preference over that thing. And, as a result, yung co-debtors, guarantors, and sureties shall be released. So that ends our discussion for payment or performance as a mode of extinguishing an obligation. See you next discussion for, our, for the obligations and contracts.